from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Can do it all. He's a cartoonist, playwright, novelist, screenwriter, children's, children's book author, and now memoirist. And he has won all the right awards for his efforts. A Pulitzer, an Obie, an Academy Award. Not bad for a guy who, by his own estimation, was pretty inept at most things growing up. Pfeiffer was born in 1929 and weathered the Depression, poor and Jewish in the Bronx. He was the skinny kid, the scared one. Other kids had baseball bats and could use them. He had a piece of chalk. And to keep bullies at bay, he drew Popeye on the sidewalk. But the chalk wasn't magic. The colleges he dreamed of attending rejected him. He had a miserable army stint, and there was no end to his mother troubles. As he has said, there are people who give you nothing but bad advice. And unfortunately, one of them was my mother. <laughs> but Jules Pfeiffer overcame it all. Eventually, his Village Voice comic strip, which brilliantly reflects our cultural angst, was syndicated in 100 newspapers. He illustrated the classic children's book, The Phantom Tollbooth. He wrote the movie, Carnal Knowledge, the play, Little Murders. And now in his memoir, Backing Into Forward, he takes us through the terrible and wonderful odyssey that is his life. For more than 50 years, that life has been devoted to taking the powerful down a notch or two. The chalk is gone, replaced by sheaves of satirical comics. Pfeiffer is an American treasure for both the depth and style of his work. He's analytical and witty, and he teaches us about ourselves. As one reviewer has said, he's the link from Lenny Bruce to Larry David, from James Thurber to Art Spiegelman. Please join me in welcoming Jules Pfeiffer. It's a pleasure to be here. I've just finished a gig with Norton Juster in the kiddies section uh, and talking about his new children's book, The Odious Ogre, which I illustrated. And that illustrates um, the varied career I have. Most people know me as a cartoonist, of course. But even from the beginning as a cartoonist, as a Village Voice cartoonist, beginning in 50, October 56, it's never been about the pictures alone, and in some cases, never about the pictures mainly. It's always been about voice. And this was not known to me at the time. It was not thought about at the time. I'll, from the time I was a kid, being a cartoonist was all that interested me. And what cartooning meant was not gag cartoons, as one found in New Yorker. I love those but I couldn't do them and didn't think in that vein. I was a strip cartoonist and loved the strip form. And the strip form were words and pictures. And the comic strip at the time, the newspaper strip at the time, unlike today when they're reduced to time, so, so, so minuscule that you can't have anything complicated in them, you can't tell real stories in them. They're not very funny and they're not particularly well drawn. A few are, like Mutz and one or two others. And a few still try to be profound, like Gary Trudeau and, 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 and the everlasting and ever brilliant Doonesbury, but there ain't much out there. But this was a form, before it got so reduced in size, that used to run across a page, and I'm talking about the years of my growing up, the 1930s and 40s, before movies were in Technicolor. There were a few in color, but not many. Before the age of television, certainly before the age of electronics, and iPhones and videos and one kind of thing and another. And the comic strip was a major American form. The comic strip was part of the culture, no less than movies or theater. The comic strip was joked about on radio by Bob Hope and Fred Allen and other comedians because it, was, because it represented a focal point that everybody understood. When you talked about Dick Tracy or Lil Abner or other characters at the time in the 1940s, there wasn't a member of the audience numbering into the millions who didn't know who those characters were, or Andy Gump. This was a form that had taken the country from the time of its inception 
and it wasn't that old. The, the first comic strips began in about 1890-95. And so when I was a kid in the 1930s, it was still in the age of its early developmental years and early experimental years. It was no more than 30, 40 years old, which is still pretty young for a field such as that. And it was also at its most engaging and its most, exp uh, the adventure strip had just come into play a few years before. And strips used to run across a page. And they, there were five columns, six columns, and you could get detail and detail and detail in the drawing. And there were any number of brilliant artists working in them who never thought of their work as art. Milton Kniff, who did Terry and the Pirates, uh, which was one of the great combinations of storytelling and, and uh, uh, text and pictures, uniting the two of them, was, uh, he was a teacher to me. I mean, I, I learned virtually nothing in the schools I went to. I spent 12 years in public education in the Bronx, learned zilch. <laughs> but when I opened up those comic strips, whether it was uh, Terry and the Pirates by Eisner, whether it was uh, uh, Prince Valiant by Hal Foster, whether it was Little Abner by Al Cap or Abby and Slats, which also written by Al Cap and illustrated by a great illustrator named Irvin Van Buren. This was my education as a kid, and particularly Will Eisner's coming out in 1940, The Spirit. Uh, these masters, and they were masters, never saw themselves as artists. They thought artist was kind of a fancy statement. They didn't regard what they did as art. They didn't regard what they did as being part of any serious game. It was just the way they made a living, and if they saw themselves as anything, they liked to see themselves as newspaper men in that Ben Heck, Charles MacArthur, tough guy stance. They wanted to be seen, and often were, as hard drinking, hard boozing, uh, gambling characters, gambling and gambling irresponsible, meeting deadlines to the last second with a hangover. Uh, they liked that image of themselves and the fact that these originals, these originals art, was tossed, was destroyed, was thrown out by the newspapers once they had published it. Uh, nothing was saved or very little was saved. Was not a shock to them. They didn't view it as scant. They didn't want their work back. They didn't ask for their, their originals back. They didn't think they had any use other than clutter uh, and this went on for years until a later generation of younger cartoonists, namely the generation I represented, saw this stuff as something these old timers didn't. Excuse me. But I love these guys, and I love what I loved mostly was the act of storytelling, how they told the story, how they created character, how different characters, even in comic strips. Uh, spoke in different ways, had different uh, had styles of, 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 uh, of vocal representation so that you could recognize them even without seeing their pictures. And uh, not all of them did that, but the best ones did. And this was part of my schooling. So when, it came, so when I, back in the 1950s, uh, began my strip, it was it was a long time since I'd given up on a notion of being a traditional strip cartoonist. I had done, after I got out of the Army in 1953, all sorts of attempts to get syndicated and to have my work, which looked like their work, and try to, this is what they do to me. They obliterate me. I'm being censored. Um, I wanted very much to be one of the big boys and join the rank of big boys as I grew up with them. But I would try to do the more traditional strips and send them around to various syndicates and they were all turned down. And, and finally, I was left without any choice but to move in another direction because all the traditional directions were closed to me. And when I went to the Village Voice to show them my work, the work I showed them was not the traditional work, but something I was trying out for some time. When I was in the Army, outraged by the fact that the United States Army would draft me, of all people, <laughs> during the Korean War, when I had other plans. Uh, as Dick Cheney said, remember him? Uh, um, 
when he was asked why he was not in the Vietnam War, which he was so in favor of, he said he, his answer was, I had other priorities. Well, so did I. <laughs> I, had, I had certainly as many priorities as, 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 as Dick Cheney, and most of them were less lethal. <laughs> but not all of them. And in the Army, in reaction to what I found was the oppressiveness of the military and the mindless of the military, and nothing has changed, um, I started drawing, coming to, as, a, as a means of survival, as a means of retaining my sanity. I began to make up a story about a little boy of four years old who was drafted into the Army by mistake. <laughs> Talk about metaphor. and, and uh, and I called it Monroe, and it was my first satire, though, although I didn't realize what it was going to be. And it was the first time I tried to work in terms of cartoon narrative, telling a story in words and pictures, the way comic strips are supposed to be, but also using the style and form of a children's book, uh, a children's book for grown-ups, but certainly a children's approach where there's narrative and there are balloons, uh, and there's the storytelling. And the storytelling takes our little boy Monroe through the army where he tries to explain he's only four and nobody believes him. And the whole point behind the story was to express my rage and my anger at the policies of a military and the policies of a country for that matter in the midst of a Cold War where mindlessness often ruled the day and good sense often was ruled out. And, uh, but to show it, as I understood then, and as I have always understood, to show it in innocent terms. I mean, I understood that I could not take a message, which at the time was quite political and overt, take a message that was counter to the politics and notions and established uh, uh, institutional feel at the time. Take that and make it a document of rage. Nobody would pay attention, it wouldn't be accepted, and nobody would hear what I was saying. I had to do what I've done my entire career, which was use sleight of hand and fool them. Basically seduce the reader into a story that was going to be charming, that was going to be innocent, that was going to be fun, and fun was operative here. I had to have fun doing it, and so I wanted it to be fun for the reader, but I also thought the fun was a way of getting through the point before anybody knows I'm slipping it at them. The fun was there to say strong things that ordinarily, in polite company back in the 1950s, in the heyday of McCarthyism, were not acceptable. So early on, I learned, in a sense, the approach that I have followed in all the forms I've worked uh, in the following 50 years. And that was um, that you can't say it directly. You can't make your point directly. You must say it indirectly. And not obscurely, not obtusely, you kind of sneak the reader along or sneak the audience along if it's a theatrical form, not leading him or her uh, down a path, they don't know where they're going, and often as I write these things, I don't know where I'm going. It's often, I don't know where I'm headed at all. I heard Jonathan Franzen before talking about his objection to those writers who say their characters take over, and of course he says that's baloney, the characters never take over, and that uh, in a real book, you, you know exactly where you're going. And now I have to warn you about truth. There is writer's truth, which is what everything that I believe is a writer, and then there, and then there is, and then there is nonsense, which is what every other writer believes. Uh, I found that often with my own work in all of these forms, that the voice I chose began as in the cartoons a form of improvisation, as one used to see on the stage with. Second City in Chicago or Nichols and May, uh, 
where you start with an opening line and just follow the music of the word, see where it leads you, not knowing, and I often didn't know where it was going. I knew perhaps what I was aiming at. I mean, something viscerally told me, say, if, it's a, if, if I was making a comment about relationships, what comment I wanted to make, I just didn't know how I was going to get there. If it was about politics, then it was going to be a comment on the growing war in Vietnam at the time, or civil rights. I knew the point I wanted to get to. I just had no real notion what was going to take me there. So it's a combination of uh, having intent and then giving up the intent to the innocence of creation. And that innocence of creation, will you surrender to a higher truth than anything the brain will give you. You, you. you give up this for this. And you let the gut lead you. And you let the gut do the writing. And the gut will take you uh, down a certain path. And if it works, it will be the right path. And if it doesn't, you go back and do it over again. There are cartoons over the years that I wrote. Um, and these were, at first, acts of writing before I drew them. That I would write on yellow scraps of paper and they would go perfectly until the last panel. And then I'd have no last panel. I'd have no payoff. I thought, this is great stuff. I have no way of ending it. And give up after a day or so and put it away in a file. And sometimes, 25 years later, I'd go through that file looking for something else, find the cartoon, read, the, read it, and suddenly the last panel would write itself and I'd have it in, in, in a minute, or less than a minute. And there it was a perfect cartoon that took only 25 years to put together. <laughs> it, you know, and, and 25 years earlier, I wouldn't have had a clue how to do it. These things do take control of you. It's not you who are running it, although you do run it sometimes. And sometimes the things you do run and, and do control are, ba are, are often your most mediocre efforts. Sometimes, oftentimes, I find that the work that's most alive when I'm at it is the work that controls me as much as I'm controlling it. Uh, I, that, that when I went into theater, uh, my first play, Little Murders, was a thesis play. I was trying to say something about the dissolution. Hello. It's, I've never worked in a room like this before. <laughs> I was trying to say something about the dissolution of authority in America post John F. Kennedy assassination, um, after November 22nd, 1963. For the following year, I noticed increasingly a breakdown of, a th of all forms of authority, uh, both personal level in families and, and, and in institutional levels in schools, religion, go certainly government. I mean, everything seemed to be falling apart as it had not done. Uh, for many years. Basically, we had been, when Kennedy was president, this, the same country we had been from the days before World War II, um, after the Depression on. And suddenly it was all falling apart and coming unglued. And I was waiting for, to read people writing about it and hear some comment on it, and it wasn't happening. And so my first play, my first play came about purely by accident because I wanted to comment on this thing that wasn't being commented on. I knew the cartoon, which was my form at the time, uh, and my only form at the time, um, wasn't adequate to say something as uh, profound as I wanted to say. So I began fooling around with the idea as a novel, which got nowhere, and finally in desperation as a play. And the play <coughs> began, um, with me having lots of notes about I wanted, what I wanted to do, but really not knowing how to go about it, and then simply writing down and letting it take over. And it took over. And it, it led me down these paths, some of which worked, some of which didn't, but became my first play, taught me that I was a playwright. And, uh, and from that point on, I engaged in his career where the, with theater writing was every bit as much fun, in many cases more fun than writing the comic strip. And that led me into other forms. You know, that, that, and I should say, it was all about voice. That the voice of the comic strip, and, which is, has to be because of the form, six or eight panels, has to be terse, has to be restrictive. That's not the voice you use as a playwright. 
And as a playwright, you've got a lot of room to talk. And you can talk and talk and talk. And you have monologues. And you can have a lot of fun with language. You can engage, indulge in language in, in theater the way you can't um, and shouldn't in a comic strip or in a movie. And then writing a screenplay, um, which is unfriendly to monologues, you, you write in another form. So all of these forms have, have different demands, but they're all about voice. They're all about language. When I started writing the memoir, Backing Into Forward, the book I'm here to talk about and have indirectly, um, I had to find a voice for the guy telling the story. That, that the first person in memoirs or in anything that's supposed to be personal and, and biographical um, is only a substitute for who and what you really are. It's a front. It's, uh, it's an idealized version of how you want to come across because none of us, including me right now, really sounds that way. You, you, you want to be saying everything you believe on paper, but you're putting it in ways that are uh, that as far as you can manage are the most engaging to the reader, the most seductive to the reader, the most open-seeming, but all of it has to do not just with putting it down, it also has to do with art and craft and years of, of, of learning what people will take and what they won't take, what plays before an audience and what doesn't. So all of it is a form of, as I said before, sleight of hand. It's a game. And it's that game that I have never stopped playing and still enjoy playing. It says there I'm over time, which means there's no time for questions or is there? There is time for questions. Two questions? All right. Who has two very good questions? Now, I gotta tell you this. Uh, it doesn't matter who asked the questions, I'm not gonna hear them, I'm deaf. So, uh, so it might be best if you came right up here and addressed them directly. Uh, and, and here's a mic. And forgive me, but I'm just... just uh, first of all, I just want to say I was a big fan of the uh, book about the boy going into the army. I remember the panel where he was sitting taking a test and he was making a drawing of a picture and the soldier next to him was looking over and copying that picture. <laughs> uh, what I did want to ask you, you're talking about cartoonists and I was wondering how you felt about uh, animated uh, movies and television shows like the work of Brad Bird, uh, I don't know if you're The Incredibles and uh, Ratatouille and, and how, if that in any way is similar to what was going on with the uh, art cartoonist you talked about. I don't know why. I've never, I've worked in animation and worked for, used to work <coughs> in the 50s and early 60s for an outfit called Terry Tunes that did Tom Terrific, which some of you may remember. And, and, but I've never been interested in animation as a form. Uh, and I never wanted to do animated cartoons. Monroe as an animated cartoon came around by accident because it was Gene Deitch who ran Terry Tunes who wanted, who bought it and, um, and I was very happy with, with the results and it won an Academy Award. But uh, I, don't, I don't look at animated cartoons. I haven't seen Up, I haven't seen, uh, uh, the, the, Miyazaki, the Japanese filmmaker, is the one I've seen mo more of and I think he's brilliant. But, uh, and there's, there's one called My Dog Tulip Out Now, which is a wonderful piece of work. And there's countless wonderful things being done, and they will remain uncounted by me because I'm not going to see most of them. It's not a form I have a lot of curiosity about. One more question? Oh, yeah, hi. I was wondering what your experience was like working <coughs> with Mike Nichols uh, on the screenplay for Carnal Knowledge. Was it pleasant? experience with Hollywood people or not? Now, for those of you who've read the book, Backing Into Forward, you wouldn't have to ask that question, so I urge you <laughs> to buy the book, Else Why Am I Here? Uh, um, it's, uh, Carnal Knowledge was originally written as a play. I sent it to Mike. He called me, he read it in 24 hours, called me back and he said, I want to do this, but I think it's a movie, not a play. What do you think? And I said, what about the language? He said, we won't have any trouble with the language. What do you think? And I said, give me 30 seconds. Um, now, uh, and then he really put me through when it came time to work on the screenplay, a tutorial on how you turn a play script full of long speeches, as I have talked about, you know, what theater is, into uh, a screenplay where we did have monologues, but they did what didn't run nearly as long as the ones in the play. 
and to make it seem natural to the form. And it was, a, from beginning to end, it was about the most joyful collaboration I've ever had, and I've been fortunate to have a lot of very good collaborations, but uh, this was the best. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.